They will tackle an issue that has also, uh, I think, triggered and is triggering continuing legal debates and controversy, and that has a variety of different legal implications, namely the topic of algorithms and discrimination. Uh, and for that topic, uh, it's my great pleasure that Selim El Sayed is joining us. Um, Selim is a doctoral researcher in the Department of Political Science and he's a member of the uh, of our research platform. Um, he did a master's degree in international public management and political science at uh, Sciences Po and at the Free University of Berlin. And he holds uh, uh, an undergrad degree from uh, University College Maastricht uh, with a focus, focus on international relations and law. Uh, and Selim is a real expert, I think, in this um, domain. He even did his his thesis, master thesis on German litigation frameworks, uh, ability to safeguard citizens from algorithmic discrimination. Uh, so his, uh, his work precisely on this topic. Also, he is as a pre-doctoral uh, research fellow uh, in the digitized project here at the University of Vienna. He's developing of ethical and social standards for the collection and use of data in computational social sciences. Uh, the reading for today is a book chapter, Discrimination in the Age of Algorithms by uh, Robin Nunn. And uh, the format today is, as usual, uh, Selim will uh, talk for maybe an hour or so, uh, and then we'll have time for a Q&A. Uh, and Selim just told me he also invites uh, input questions um, during the, uh, the talk as well. So feel free to use the chat um, if you'd like to raise any um, any questions of understanding. And I'll try to moderate that. But uh, keep in mind, we have time for uh, an extended debate towards the end of the lecture uh, as well. Uh, so without further ado, Salim, thanks very much for take, making the time for us. Um, and over to you, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, Lucas, thanks so much for having us, or uh, having me. Um, like you already said, today's lecture is on algorithms and discrimination. I didn't know my introduction would be so far reaching. So I actually prepared a slide introducing myself, which I'm going to skip now since you did such a wonderful job doing that already. We can basically, um, jump straight into the structure of today's presentation. I'll start by introducing you into the topic. Um, I'll give you some examples of how algorithms discriminate or where algorithms discriminate, just like very generally speaking. Um, then we'll go kind of take a deep dive and look into what does discrimination mean? What does it mean in our day-to-day -day life, but also what does it mean in a legal sense and how does that apply to algorithms, which is the next block. Um, I know that especially for those of you who followed through with the, um, with the other presentations of the lecture series that you've gotten kind of a basis of algorithms already in the lecture of Professor Plant from the computer science department. Um, but I will recap some of that in very social science-y terms um, and kind of those aspects that are really relevant to make the point here. Um, I'm just warning you already, you're going to have to bear with me up until the next part, which is, I guess, what you're here for, kind of the substance of how algorithms is then actually discriminate or how they actually can discriminate. So we have to set, um, we have to do quite a bit of kind of like setting the stage, but I'll promise I'll, I'll do my best for it to stay like kind of like um, understandable. Then we can look at some responses briefly, kind of what has been suggested to curtail um, discrimination by algorithms or through algorithms. And I'll give you some context and kind of what are the broader societal developments within which we're moving and how do we situate the use of algorithms and their discriminatory potential on their end. Then I'll show you the literature that I used and give you two sources that are very dear to me and I think they're very interesting. So I'm going to give you two literature recommendations in the end. One thing and kind of Lucas already said this. Uh, that is really important to me is that all of you can follow so if at any point you feel like okay I, I didn't really quite catch that or I didn't understand that please feel free to ask in the chat if it's necessary for you to um, get an answer so you can understand it would be not nice if you I don't know midway didn't understand like one small concept and then you can't follow through 
So yeah, please feel free to use the chat and Lucas kindly agreed to, to let me know because I can't see the chat. Okay, so let's jump straight in. Um, before I can explain to you what's going on in this picture, we have to take, take a step back and talk about criminal justice. So if you were convicted of a crime um, and you, you're up for parole, which means maybe you get an early release or you're up for your um, normal release, not an early release, in the process of that, there is something at play called a risk score that has been part of criminal justice for a long time. And what happens there is that, and because you're about to be released, but you, you have been convicted of a crime, um, authorities just want to make sure that you're not very likely to recommit the crime. So how do they do that? They use risk scores. And now we can get to the picture. This is the picture of um, two persons. Both were arrested for petty theft arrests, uh, for petty theft, that is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, geringfügiger Diebstahl, for those who don't know. And um, on the left-hand side, we have a white male, Mr. Prater, who was scored um, at a low risk of recommitting a crime. And on the right-hand side, side, we have Ms. Bishop Borden, who is a black female, and she was, um, well, the algorithm said that she was a high risk of recommitting a crime. Even though they were arrested for the same crimes, this is not the only thing that the algorithm takes into consideration. It takes 137 survey questions into consideration and then based on those questions kind of spits out or delivers the risk score. So what exactly has happened here? Um, that's the very last slide of this presentation. So we'll understand um, the theory and then we'll come back to this example. And has this algorithm worked? Um, well, no because um, two years later, we know that the computer algorithm got it exactly backward. Um, Ms. Borden has not been charged with any new crimes while Mr. Prater is currently serving or is serving an eight year prison term for subsequently breaking into a warehouse and stealing thousands of dollars worth of electronics. So what we can see here is that these risk scores, at least in this, in this case, didn't do um, such a great job. So just keep that in the back of your head as we continue. Um, I have another example, and maybe some of you also heard about this example already. Um, throughout different institutions, companies, um, more and more of the human resource management is kind of delegated to algorithms. Imagine you get hundreds, 100, 150 um, applications for a job. You don't want to go through them hand by hand. So more and more companies are <clears throat> using algorithms to filter. And uh, among those companies is Amazon. And Amazon played around with an algorithm for hiring new people. And it found out over time that the company, that the algorithm kind of penalized resumes that had the word women in them. So, and more often than not, these came from women. So let's say your resume mentioned that you were the um, president of the women's chess club. The algorithm would penalize the word women in there, effectively discriminating against women or effectively being biased against women. Um, yeah, and so how did that happen? We'll also get there in the end, but that's just kind of like for you to know, okay, what is he talking about here? Okay, <clears throat> moving on to the next part. Um, so discrimination as a term can have um, quite a neutral meaning and it's really just depending on the way you use it, it can just be the, the act of making a difference or a distinction between two things. So when you talk about a dog's nose or a dog's sense of scent can discriminate between different um, scents. But, and we can either discuss this collectively or um, yeah, maybe actually, what do you think, how would you understand if somebody talks to you about discrimination in our day-to-day -day use of the word like kind of, how would you define that very broadly speaking? You can either raise your hand or um, write your answer in the chat. Uh, Daphne says negative has a negative connotation of a differentiation. Uh, and I was throwing into the game making distinctions. Valerie Albrecht suggests it's, uh, it's got a negative connotation experiencing disadvantages because of certain characteristics mm -hmm. experiencing disadvantages because of certain characteristics 
Wow, somebody's already got, skipping. That's really good. Disadvantaging, Leonie says, disadvantaging someone based on specific differences. Mm -hmm. Disadvantaging someone based on specific differences. Yeah. So we have distinctions, differentiation, disadvantage, um, and the, yeah, these were sort of the terms that came up. Yeah, um, I'll take all of them, especially the ones that are using terminologies such as characteristics. <clears throat> you're onto something or you're lawyers, I don't know. So um, this is a, a definition from, um, from a study on discrimination risk through algorithms. And there, discrimination is defined as a socially undesirable, unequal treatment or worse treatment of persons. And so this is still very general because it kind of shows that this is you can just sense that this is kind of something we don't want. It's socially undesirable. This is not a legal definition yet, as you can see, because how would you define socially undesirable, right? So before we get into the legal definition, um, I want to go through one more thing with you. And that's kind of, especially if we use <clears throat> language such as socially undesirable, we're onto something here, right? And we're onto the fact that discrimination is not rigid. It's not fixed. And so what um, Carsten Orbert says is that, um, which actions are considered discriminatory differs across societies, times, and regions. And also it differs according to who gets to speak or who get, whose kind of view um, yeah, gets the stage. Also, um, he says that kind of the delimitation of what is considered discriminatory tends to be the result of social conflicts, negotiations, and agreements. And you can see from all of these words, this is all kind of a process and it's all yeah, it's all really conflictual language. Um, what's important is that how kind of in the end, what comes out out of those social conflicts or the agreements that have been found usually get codified somehow, right? Because you wanna, you wanna kind of steer society to follow that way or you wanna make certain things illegal. So the codifications of those agreements um, can often be found in constitutional and human rights law. And, and I don't think, uh, and I mean, to an extent, um, uh, Professor Forgo talked about this in his lecture, they're also in European law. So before we continue, and I don't remember who brought the characteristics in, but that person was onto something, is that the definition that we'll be working with throughout this lecture is that discrimination is <clears throat> unfavorable and unjustified, unequal treatment of persons in connection with a protected characteristic. Um, I have to qualify one thing here because, and you'll see why in a bit, because it says unequal treatment. And that kind of implies that you're deliberately doing something or with intent. So keep the word treatment in the back of your head. I promise I'll pick up on it later. Um, okay, so about those protected characteristics, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I know this is in German, but I suppose most will understand. I'll also go through it. Um, the characteristics that are considered protected <clears throat> are not the same in all the different laws. So, for example, race or ethnic origin is considered a protected characteristic in the German Basic Law, in the Grundgesetz, in the General Law on Equal Treatment, in Recital 71 of the General Data Protection Regulation, and in Article 9 of that same regulation. Whereas, let's say, um, sex, or I think it's sex here, um, is only considered a protected characteristic in the <clears throat> German basic law and in the general law on equal treatment. And this is not an exhaustive list. I just want to show you that some laws include some protected characteristics, <clears throat> while other laws don't. So, for example, religion and worldview, which is maybe also something that's actually quite difficult to define is included in all of those. Okay, so we figured out um, discrimination is not rigid. We figured out that a definition of discrimination in law requires protected characteristics. <clears throat> and we've seen here that those characteristics are also not the same everywhere. So let's go a bit deeper here. And all of this is intended to just show you that this is um, to give you more of an, of an understanding of protected characteristics as a concept. And so this is um, Article 3, Paragraph 3 of the German Basic Law. 
and it reads um no person shall be favored or disfavored because of sex parentage race language homeland and origin faith or religious or political opinions no person shall be disfavored because of disability so you can see a list of protected characteristics here <clears throat> so why am i saying that those are not rigid um, in 2019, there has been quite a lively debate with a fair amount of involvement from civil society, arguing that sexual orienta orientation should be included here, and that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation should also be illegal, on a constitutional rank even, sorry. And so um, they suggested to change the um, German basic law, but uh, the Christian conservative party, kind of like the two center-right parties together blocked this um, <clears throat> amendment to the constitution and so i'm just showing you here that the content of what 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 should be considered a protected characteristic um there's a lot of conflict around that and that's just something to keep in the back of your head <clears throat> as we progress here okay so now that we've kind of gotten the basics let's move to um, let's distinguish two different types of discrimination in law. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. We'll start with the first one, and that is direct discrimination. In the US literature, that's sometimes called disparate treatment, if anyone um, yeah, is interested in how it's in different um, jurisdictions. And so direct discrimination is treating someone differently on the basis of or with reference to a protected characteristic. So let's say I were to hire someone and I already say, I do not hire um, women, like straight up. If I say that like that, that's direct discrimination. Or I don't hire <clears throat> black persons, that would be direct discrimination as well. Um, or I, I don't hire disabled people, that would be direct discrimination. Um, sometimes direct discrimination can be justifiable in a legal sense justifiable. And um, that can only happen with reference to a closed list of justifications that are kind of already included in the law. We're not going to go into detail here because there's a whole bunch of literature we would have to open up here. But the idea is that direct discrimination is usually straight out prohibited and <clears throat> much harder to justify if you were to insist on um, doing it. What's more interesting, especially what's more interesting um, in relation to algorithms, as we'll see in a bit, is indirect discrimination. And in the literature on the US law, that's called disparate impact. And this comes, um, or basically indirect discrimination is when a seemingly neutral policy or decision produces discriminatory, <clears throat> I think it's the heating air, effects on people within a protected category so you're not taking that characteristic um, as is into your decision making but your policy ends up having the same effect why is that important because it's just important to understand here discrimination is not only related to intent and the active inclusion of a protected protected characteristic <coughs> but it can also be just effect related. Um, here, justification is not as, or your leeway for justifying such discrimination is bigger basically, or it's, it's more, because if there's a legitimate aim or you have a measure that's appropriate and necessary, you can kind of justify keeping that indirect discrimination. So this is a, a fine line and I just, you don't have to know all of that, but what I do want you to know is that there's a difference between those two, between direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Now we've gotten, we've covered discrimination and we've covered the examples. So let's now talk about algorithms. Um, uh, Salim, can I, yeah. can I just stop you for a sec? Um, yeah, of course. In, in, uh, Perhaps you could go back uh, one slide. Can you just give us an example, perhaps, uh, from outside the realm of algorithms of what would constitute indirect discrimination by an employee, for instance, um, just off the top of your head? I wonder if you can make something up. By an employer, I can. Uh, sorry, by an employer, yeah, I mean. 
Uh, yeah, I can do that. Um, so let's say you were to um, hire only, okay, so you are a bank and you hire only finance graduates who finished either at Wharton, Princeton, or I don't know, Harvard. Mm -hmm. And these universities are disproportionately attended by um, white male students. <clears throat> don't pin me down on the numbers exactly, but let's just go with that idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't hire any people who attended two-year colleges or for-profit universities, <clears throat> which are overproportionately attended by um, African-American women let's go with that example, then your policy might have a discriminatory effect, even though you never intended it to be. Right, right. Gotcha. So that is an example of indirect discrimination. Okay. So you, um, you had a, a neutral policy tool, and whether you liked it or not, it turned out to have this discriminatory effect. Okay. Yeah. Whereas in direct discrimination, it's explicit. You say yeah. you only hire men or something like that. Yeah, exactly. But so, of course, this is um, <clears throat> difficult to prove, right? Because it's incredibly difficult to prove that someone um, decided that this would be the criterion they go by. So this right. was, both are very like the first one is even harder to prove because let's say <clears throat> you technically have to be able to look into um, the decision making documents of the bank mm -hmm. and the, the HR documents. Mm -hmm. Well, in the second one, you look at effects and you look at numbers. And in the first one, if you, even if only white men worked at the company, that might be due to other reasons, right? So you, it's very hard to bring a claim um, alleging direct discrimination. Right, right. In either case, you do need justification, though. So you could be challenged um, <clears throat> in a court or something. And then you'd have to provide a, a justification for why you need specific educational attainment or something like that. Yeah, exactly. If you can provide that, the discrimination may be legally speaking. Okay. I mean, if you want to, we can we can stay a bit in that and do a whole example. Like I can expand a bit <clears throat> if that's as you, as you like. I, I don't want to derail your talk. I, I would just that's no, I'm just good. a question of understanding. I'm just uh, I just I've prepared a, a lot of content, and I think. Um, like Do I will on. definitely be on. able to I think finish. It, I think yeah? it's clear so far. Yeah. Okay. If it's not, um, somebody um, message in the chat, and we'll stop yeah. and come back to this. Okay. Thank you, Silly. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> okay. Algorithms. What are algorithms? Um, algorithms, very broadly speaking, are devised to solve a problem computationally. They're step-by-step -step instructions for acting on some kind of input to achieve a desired result or output, I wish they would have said output. So it's a computational problem. Um, you get some input, you act on that input, you get an output or result. That's all you need to know right now. And I'm sure all of you know that already. Um, let's do some examples of what you can use an algorithm for. So an algorithm is at work when you file your text declaration on your computer. So you put in your taxable income, you put in your tax deductions, you put in your number of children, <clears throat> you put in your, I don't know, um, more information on yourself. And the algorithm acts on that and then tells you your tax debt, right? This is something that um, most of us have probably done at some point. So this is also an algorithm. Um, you can also use an algorithm for the administration of welfare benefits. So let's um, stick with the Let's stick with the same example. Um, you put in your available income, your number of children, and the algorithm based on that determines that you are eligible for certain welfare benefits. Some algorithms can also help you request them, but that's not the point here. <clears throat> I just want to give you some examples. Okay, um, what can algorithms also be used for? Um, they can be used for predicting recidivism risks, right? Remember recidivism is, um, the risk of you re-offending. Um, and how does that work? In the algorithm we talked about in the beginning, the Compass algorithm, it takes 137 questions and based on those questions predicts your risk. Um, what those questions are, you'll find out um, on the very last slide, I think. Um, okay, what can algorithms also be used for? 
um, <clears throat> in making loan decisions. So let's say you're a bank and you have decided that uh, the, the decision process of whether you want to grant someone a, a credit a credit line or a loan um, is very cumbersome and very tiring. So you want to automatize it. So you can also use an algorithm on that based on the stability of the income, based on the total income, based on the type of work contract. The person can input, right? Input all of those things. Then the algorithm acts on that and combines them somehow and gives a decision which says, yes, you can get a loan for this much money <clears throat> or you can't. Okay. <clears throat> Also, before we continue with the technicalities, and I think that this is a very helpful way of thinking about um, the type of algorithm we're talking about here, is that you use an algorithm to reach some kind of missing information. So let's say you wanna hire a new person, you wanna hire new staff. What you, the piece of information that you're missing is that applicant's productivity. Yeah, so you want to know how will this person perform, <clears throat> but you can't know unless you hire everyone and measure their performance, right? So you come up with the algorithm and the underlying idea is that you kind of try to figure out <clears throat> your best guess at predicting the applicant's performance based on how similar people have performed. Um, just for the sake of completeness, here we're really talking about a specific type of algorithm that is quite widely used. It's called the screening algorithms and screener, screening algorithms or screeners um, basically choose a person or multiple people from a pool of candidates to accomplish a particular goal. And so, for example, in um, admitting someone to college or in hiring someone, um, this is the case. Okay, so any questions so far? Everything. Would you say an, an entry exam to a university or college uh, is of that kind, of that sort of algorithmic screening kind, or is that something different? Um, no, that's something um, different, because let's say you could take that exam um, in a room and no one and you just put a number on it and no one knows who you are so no information about you other than how you did in that test is included in making the decision <clears throat> now you might have become kind of a victim of previous discrimination right you might have not been able to go to a great school or other things but that is not the type we're talking about here because mm -hmm. they're the only criterion upon which the decision is made is your test score right does that, if that was the question, does that? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure it was the question. It's interesting, nevertheless, though, because it clarifies an important point. So um, if, if something is inferred sort of from your characteristics, this is what you, we are worrying about here. This yeah. is the kind of the screening algorithm approach. Yeah. If, you're, if the thing that you're interested in directly is uh, ex examined, sort of tested, uh, that is that is not the kind of algorithmic screening procedure that we are investigating here, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I mean, Shamal, feel free to um, to rephrase if that didn't answer your question. There is also another question by Shamal that I think we uh, will come back in the um, come back to in the Q and A because uh, it's uh, it, it's a wider question. It will open up a, a bigger box, but we'll come back to it. Okay. Yeah, let's um, do that. Okay. Let's do it like that. And we'll get into I, like all of this information is following now. <clears throat> Anyways, so maybe that'll help also. Okay, so when we talk about screening algorithms, um, and this is what I meant with the way everybody has to bear with me because everything will come together in a second. Um, we actually talk about two algorithms. So when we talk about um, any screening rules, so let's say hiring new staff, um, we have two algorithms at work and the one that we see or the one that we talk about is called the screening algorithm or screener and so what does the screener do <clears throat> and this might be what you were um, referring to um, the screener takes a weighted combination of characteristics of an individual that individual could be a job applicant it could be a potential borrower it could be a criminal defendant and those characteristics could be uh, their income, the university they went to, um, their zip code. So the screener takes that 
And based on these characteristics, and this is where it's different from <clears throat> taking a test, right? Based on those characteristics, it's, predict, it's predicting how that individual will do. And so, how, for example, what could that prediction look like? It could look like this individual will, will perform very, will be a high performer at this job. The prediction could also be this person is going to default on their credits. Don't give them the credit. Or the prediction could be um, this person is likely to recommit a crime. And then based on that prediction, and this is where you, where you kind of see the real world effects of this, a decision um, is made either by a human or by the um, computer or by the algorithm itself. And so for example, that decision could be hire the person, reject or accept the loan application, deny early release, um, give the person extra monitoring after they've been released, if, it, if it's a criminal defendant. Um, and so this is kind of the process about which we're talking. Is that understandable so far? If no objections arise. Okay. Yeah. I think I got it, um, Salim. I think, I think you made an important distinction there. And, and by the way, we can even perhaps draw the two things together with the exam because it just jumped to my mind that in the UK during the COVID crisis what they did is they um, tried to infer the likely uh, exam results uh, of pupils in uh, I think middle schools because they couldn't sit the exams for pandemic reasons and then they used previous grades essentially uh, plus uh, student pupil characteristics uh, I think attendance and things like that to infer what would have been the likely grade um, of this pupil mm -hmm. so this is kind of exactly this approach a prediction of the exam results right? but it's a bit different and that's very important because you're okay. using data on the person in the example that you're talking mm -hmm. about you're mm -hmm. predicting mm -hmm. my uh, grade from my past grades but right. in this example you're predicting my grades from past grades of people who are like me somehow right not right? from a population that is similar you mean or or yes from a population that is similar but from a population that's not just me like right. in this other example you're like or maybe i'm not even sure maybe in the grading thing they did it that way too but maybe we'll pick up on that later yeah, and I don't yeah. know the details. Um, Edgar added uh, in the chat, maybe we can also perhaps come back to that. He, he wonders maybe the framing of questions could also be discriminatory. Yeah. I mean, surely in an exam. Um, let's put it to the Q&A and, um, so and plow on a little bit. I meant more, exactly. I meant more if you have something that you don't understand in order to follow the presentation. Um, I don't know, maybe for the other things that are more discussion questions, maybe add them at the end, but as you like. Okay, so we, we've understood what the screener does, right? It takes the characteristics of an, of an individual, <clears throat> it combines them somehow. Based on that, it predicts their performance on some metric, and that prediction is used to make a decision, okay? Those are the only steps you have to remember. Okay, um, moving on. Um, so it's important to understand how we arrive at the screening algorithm if we want to understand how algorithms can discriminate. And so in order for, for us to get to the screener, um, we use a training algorithm or a trainer. And so maybe that's a bit, um, so we've understood what the screener does, but we have to get to the screener somehow. And for that, we use the trainer. Um, exactly. So the trainer is tasked with producing the screener, and it involves several points at which um, human decisions are necessary. And those are deciding which past cases to look at, which variables to include as potential predictors of the performance, and defining the outcome which we want predicted. This is just an overview. We'll go into all of those in detail. Um, before we do that, um, what have we done so far? What have we understood so far? When people say that literally anything could go into an algorithm, um, we've seen that that's not the case. And why have we seen that? Because of those, the last three points here, because of the human decisions that are at, at play here. Which past data do we look at? Which variables do we include? Which outcome do we want predicted? So like I said, we'll go into detail in a second. But what we need to understand so far is that the algorithm will always move 
within that triangle. So no, the algorithm can't do anything. Um, yeah. And what the screener ends up doing depends on human decisions made for the trainer. You know, this is a lot of new words, but uh, we're going to go through a concrete example now for you to understand. And <clears throat> interesting side note, you'll also understand the process of coming up with an algorithm. So now we're talking about the construction of the trainer, right? And the trainer is ultimately tasked with producing the screener. Um, we have several steps, which I will show you all first on this slide, and then we'll go into detail for each of those. So first, we need to collect a data set. Then we need to specify a concrete outcome to be predicted in that data set. Then we need to decide which candidate predictors to construct and make available to the, to the algorithms to be considered for inclusion in the final statistical model. I promise we'll go into detail for all of those. Um, the fourth step is then we need to build a procedure for finding the best predictor. And this is where the screener is ultimately created. And the last step is validating the procedure in a holdout set. Okay, that's just an overview. Forget all of that. And now we'll go through it step by step. What you need to remember from here is that at several of these steps, human choices and human decisions are very clearly involved. Okay, so the first step is collecting a data set. And okay, we, we said we, we're still in the hiring example, and now we have to think about which workers we want to include in our data set. And so you or me as kind of the, um, the HR manager can make a decision to say, okay, we want to include uh, the German, the Austrian, and the Swiss offices. So we want to include all workers from those offices. And we can decide on the time period that we want to include. So we want to include all hires from January 2017 to December 2020. We will keep the previous years, the previous two years, we'll save them for the holdout set. And we'll talk about the holdout set in one second. Just remember that. So we've decided we're taking the German, Austrian, Swiss offices, and we're taking the years from 2017 to 2020. Okay, moving on. Um, yeah, so that's the question that we basically answer here which set of workers are we including um okay and then in the second step we need to specify a concrete outcome to be predicted in the data set so if we were um an hr manager prior to the age of algorithms we might just say okay i just really just want to hire good employees i honestly don't care but of course I just want to hire good employees doesn't really mean anything. So when we build a trainer, we need to define what that means. So we need to be more specific. So there are different ways of how you could define that, right? So let's say for us, a person that's a good employee makes a minimum sale, makes minimum sales of 75,000 euros per quarter. That's a good employee for us. Um, or a good employee in our company we always ask our clients whether they were happy with the person they worked with and they rate them and so for us a good employee is someone who in the process of being rated by their client um gets nothing below 4.5 out of 5. or we could say for us a good employee is someone who stays with us for a long time because we are building long term and we really need people to stay on so we say for us a good employee is someone who remains in um, continuous employment with the company for at least three years. I've just given more examples to show you here. We have to decide on an outcome. We have to decide what constitutes the thing we want. We want. I hope um, that's clear so far. Okay. And, and it's important here to also see that what we choose for us to be the outcome to be predicted has a strong influence on who is hired. So let's say um, maybe we take client satisfaction and people who rate our employees are racist or they're sexist. So they on average give lower scores to women or um, people of color. These are not hypothetical examples, they're real examples. And so what we decide for uh, is the outcome to be predicted can have a discriminatory effect. Yeah, okay, I hope that's clear so far. Um, the third step, is deciding which candidate predictors to construct and to make available to the algorithm 
um, to be considered for inclusion in the final statistical model. And so that's, that's also related to the data set question. Here we basically tell the algorithm, okay, those are the things you're allowed to look at. You're allowed to look at age, you're allowed to look at gender, usually that should be allowed. You're allowed to look at the university and then see this was the, um, the Harvard Princeton Wharton example. You're allowed to look at the zip code. <clears throat> You're allowed to look at the duration of employment, whatever. We can have a list of whatever we have collected and we can allow the algorithm to consider these predictors. So at this point, they are potential predictors. What we can also do here, and this is very important, is that we can um, tell the algorithm that it is not allowed to consider certain predictors. So we can say, um, hey, when you build the algorithm, don't consider gender or don't consider race. Hmm. So this is at least equally as important that we can tell the algorithm what to consider and what to not consider. Um, okay, then there's the fourth step and that is building a procedure for finding the best predictor. And so this usually happens um, automatically. But basically, you have told the trainer, these are the people you're allowed to look at. These are the um, predictors I think could play a role and you're allowed to look at. And this is what I want predicted, right? You have decided on the outcome. <clears throat> and now you tell the trainer, now go and build me a screening algorithm. Um, yeah, and so this is what happens in this step. No, um, remember how I talked about the training set in the holdout set? So usually in the fifth step, and sometimes developers of algorithms don't do this, um, which then results just in bad algorithms, um, is that you have gotten a screener from your data set of the training set, which for our example was 2017 to 2020. And now you want to check whether <clears throat> what the screener would predict who is a good performer um, also works on a different data set because you want to check, okay, is the algorithm doing a good job at what it is supposed to do? And if the algorithm predicts the actual high performers in the years from, I think in our example, it was 2014 to 2016, then you have a good algorithm. Okay, I hope that's clear so far. Um, okay. Um, what have we learned so far? We have learned that the algorithm is really good at prediction. It's not very good at causal inference. So we've learned that um, the algorithm can tell you, well, you are a person that lives in this zip code and that went to Princeton and that, um, <clears throat> I don't know, whatever other characteristic. And our algorithm says that you are a person that is very likely to do sales of over 75,000 euros. The algorithm has absolutely no idea why that is the case, right? But it's good at predicting. So it says, if you carry this characteristic, you're likely to perform this way. What have we also learned so far? We have learned that the choices that you've made in the past, um, for example, on who to hire or on what to, how to define your outcome or on what to consider a potential predictor, all really have a powerful impact on predictions. Okay, everyone following so far, I hope. Yeah, you've, you've made it through, <laughs> through the difficult part. So now we can get to how can an algorithm actually discriminate? <clears throat> I mean, we've looked at the construction of the trainer and the individual steps that are required there. And so there are basically three points at which an algorithm can discriminate or three ways of how, an, uh, of how discrimination finds its way into the algorithm. The first one is the choice of outcome. The second one is the choice of predictors. And the third one is the choice of training procedure. And so we'll go through all of those one by one, sticking with our example of hiring someone. I hope that's good for everybody. Okay, so let's start with the first one, <clears throat> choice of outcome, first way of how an algorithm can discriminate. And that's once more, we're still in our same example, we're hiring someone to work in a bank. And we ask the question, what makes a good employee? If, I know you've heard of this example a thousand times, but um, we could have different definitions of what makes a good employee. We could say it's the total numbers of our, um, total number of hours spent at the office per week. We could say it's the 
duration of continuous employment, or we could say it's the average customer satisfaction rating. Um, now, I don't know if I want to give that, no, I will. So let's look at the um, second one, for example, right? The second suggestion, a duration of continuous employment. Now, seemingly, <clears throat> this could be a very, um, like a very harmless predictor, like no evil intent. It's all good. You just want the people to stay with your company for a long time. Now, what if it turns out that because women can get pregnant and men um, can't get pregnant, women might take parental leave. And so their employment with the company is interrupted for the duration of that parental leave. Or because of societal pressure uh, to, to stay in the job, men don't take parental leave. So their continuous, their continuous employment is longer, while as the women's continuous employment is shorter because they have been, it has been interrupted. Um, <clears throat> now, if that is the case, that could amount to indirect discrimination. Um, the same applies for average customer satisfaction rating. If your numbers are biased towards rating women um, lower than men, and there's a lot of research, for example, that says that um, <clears throat> women are much more expected to behave nicely and negotiate less harsh and, and things like that. So if there's actually a woman who's a great negotiator, the customer satisfaction rating might be lower and so this could also have a discriminatory effect on women. Now, can this can a choice of outcome amount to disparate treatment? Yes, it can. And how would that be the case? You, as a as a person um, <clears throat> telling the trainer what to do, actively, for example, choose a criterion that you know only applies to women. You could also just say. Uh, per se, being a woman or being a person of color leads to a deduction of employability. Um, that would then be disparate treatment. Can this also amount to mm, disparate impact? Yes, and sorry, disparate treatment was direct discrimination and disparate impact is indirect discrimination. Yes, and that is the case in the second example that I gave where you don't deliberately include being a woman or being a person of color but you effectively include it by, for example, defining your outcome as customer satisfaction rating. <clears throat> now you don't know that before, but it just can turn out that it is that way. Okay. Um, I have another example of how the choice of outcome can um, lead to discrimination, but I think I'll skip that um, because yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, I'll skip that. So what's another way in which discrimination can find its way into an algorithm that relates to um, the choice of predictors? So once more here, the question we ask ourselves is, <clears throat> which variables might be good at predicting my chosen outcome? Remember, that's the thing we just chose. And now we can think, okay, uh, maybe it's age, maybe it's gender, although that's a protected category. Maybe it's zip code, maybe it's university ranking, <clears throat> yeah, and so how can discrimination find its way into the algorithm here? For example, let's say you include zip code and zip codes are in many countries where kind of racial segregation in living situation is um, very clear. Zip codes can end up because they're close, closely correlated to um, race or ethnicity can end up leading to your algorithm being discriminatory. So on paper, your algorithm says, we don't hire people from that part of town. But effectively, because that part of town um, is mostly inhabited by people of color, um, the effect is still discriminatory. Same for university ranking. And that's the example we talked about um, in our previous discussion. I don't remember when it was. Um, that you end up hiring only people from very highly ranked universities. And those are overproportionately attended by white and male students. So that can also have a discriminatory effect. Bear in mind the exceptions. So you can justify and say, this is the highest quality education, whatever you can try. Um, what can also be a problem though, for choosing potential predictors, not only might you choose ones which are closely correlated to a protect, protected characteristic, 
This was the example I just gave, but you might also be collecting too little information overall. So you only have two or three potential predictors and one group is highly favored within those three predictors. But if you were to include 20 predictors, you would get a less discriminatory picture. Okay. Um, the last way in which discrimination can find its way into an algorithm is the choice of training procedure. And so this is kind of a, a overarching term and for, for what I'm about to explain now. And then part of it is, for example, the choice of your data set, right? Our data set was only the German, Swiss and Austrian offices uh, for a specific amount of years. Now, if you understand a little bit of what's going on here, you could look into that data and, for example, deliberately <clears throat> exclude very high performing um, members of a minority uh, of a minority group. So you can skew the data set in a way that it will predict something you want predicted. And that's the, the part where you willfully really create a bad track record for a group of people um, that it still has to be covered by uh, being a, a member of a protected group, right? But so you could um, include only the low performers of a, um, for women, for example, only the very, low, and you willfully exclude the high performers. You, so you, you know what you're doing if you do that. But you can also have an inadvertent effect here. And that is, if you didn't do that on purpose, you have basically barely hired women in the past. And so the algorithm thinks, well, being a woman doesn't really um, contribute to being hired because, well, we don't have a lot of women who are high performers. And that's not because of your evil intent, or at least not in that way, evil intent, but it's just because you haven't hired women in the past. Um, yeah, so those are the ways in which um, discrimination can find its way into, into an algorithm by way of the training procedure. Um, yeah, and just overall, maybe it's important to think about the fact, and this really sums up the inadvertent point, that data sets are really filtered through past decisions. So you have a lot of data on white males who went to Harvard, and these people are going to be the ones that get rehired. <clears throat> okay, so it's actually, and I know it's only been the last three or four slides, these, exp uh, these slides explain the way in which algorithms can discriminate. So let's go back to our examples before we jump into the discussion. Um, in our first example, where the... Um, where Ms. Borden got a much higher risk than a Mr. Prater, the idea was that in those 137 questions, which were considered as potential predictors, right? Somebody came up with that. Um, she, one of the questions was how many of your friends have been arrested or are you married? How old were you when your parents um, had a divorce? And so all of these numbers, all of these questions tend to apply more to black persons in the United States than to white persons. And so essentially put very kind of um, broadly, Ms. Borden got a higher score because more of her friends were in jail. And so placing that in the, in the um, language that we just learned or in the ways that we understood that algorithms can discriminate, um, here it was the choice of predictors. The choice of predictors led to discrimination against black and female persons in this compass algorithm. For our other example, the Amazon hiring example, the answer is that it was the choice of the training procedure. Because Amazon had hired such little women, the, um, the algorithm presumed that being a woman contributes negatively to being hired. So now it was the inadvertent way of coming up with a data set or using a data set for training that ends up being um, biased against women. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the technical part. Just a few more words on kind of response of what can be done about this. So one idea um, comes from two researchers at Oxford. And they say that they try to kind of encode it into a right. So they say that every person should have a right to reasonable inference. So instead of, for example, allowing you to choose a huge range of predictors, you have to think about the reasons for why a predictor is good at predicting performance. So for example, um, 
you say average test scores or GPA, they demonstrate um, work ethic and therefore I consider that. So their idea is that as a person who builds the algorithm, you have to justify at each step why you're including that. So you're not just looking for random correlations. There's another su suggestion by Andrew Tutt, and he suggests that there should be kind of a, um, an agency which allows certain algorithms or like a, how do you say that, cert like certifies the use of certain algorithms. So before you're allowed to use an algorithm on something, it has to go through, um, like you have to prove to this agency that it is not discriminatory, um, which is maybe reasonable since we've seen how easily discrimination can really find its way into the algorithm. Um, yeah, I have some more um, context, uh, but I think I will skip that for now because that's very conceptual. Or you know what, we'll only do the last point. No, we'll do all of it. Okay, so sorry. <clears throat> for the first one, for um, techno utopianism, techno utopianism um, is the is kind of um, encompasses ideologies which which build on this idea that advances in science and technology will make everyone's life great. And what we can see here is that we think that using technology on something will make it easier and will make it better. And we kind of tend to not think about all the problems that can bring. Because what's, for example, a major problem here is that past discrimination gets put into this algorithm. This algorithm discriminates, but things which, especially numbers and things which come out of computers <clears throat> usually have this air to them or this, um, they can give the impression that it's neutral and it's something you can rely on. But so you're baking old biases and forms of discrimination into a tool which can run at much bigger speeds. So let's say you have a discriminatory hiring algorithm. And now instead of looking at each of the applications, you straight out reject, I don't know, tens of thousands of people, um, minor members of minority populations or, um, yeah. So this, all of this has to be seen kind of in a, in a, in the context of this idea of like technology is, is the solution. Uh, it can be, but like, but not if it's just let loose. Um, okay, another point comes from this idea that um, as we have seen algorithms learn, or these algorithms learn from past data. So what they don't include is, um, kind of ideas about what could have been. So let's say they really just codify the status quo and keep it going as a good way of doing it. Let's say the overall productivity of the company, and that's a very boring example, could be improved if it hired more diversely. And so ideas of what could be or ways that lead to more improvement, they're not included in this type of algorithms because it learns from the past. Um, there's another point. And I think that's my last point, is that we have a finite list of protected characteristics, and yet discrimination <clears throat> and, um, can happen across multiple axes of discrimination. So you can be um, a woman and Black, and that's a different type of discrimination. But you usually can't bring claims based, based on those two. Um, also, maybe other categories deserve protection, for example, being poor maybe is a protect, is a category which should be protected because it just doesn't it, it kind of denies you access to to um, to things you could demand from your government. So the idea here is just that um, if you have a finite list of protected characteristics, other forms of discrimination and combinations of of characteristics cannot be caught by the law. Yeah. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Those are my sources, which I'll upload. And then I want to give you two literature recommendations before we move on. And so those that really want like an, an easy reading and who think that this is interesting, I really recommend this book by uh, Virginia Eubanks, Automating Inequality, because that especially talks about um, poverty and kind of the, the use of algorithms in the administration of um, the welfare state. And that's an excellent read. Um, and for those who want to go more into the te technical stuff, I really recommend this paper by, <clears throat> oh, I think I cut off the authors. Um, anyways, they're all 
very well known in the field among them Alex Hanna who works at Google Emily Bender um, who was a kind of a pioneer in natural language processing and they talk about the use of data in a much more sophisticated way than I did but um, yeah so I hope that this is a good starting point for all of you and that you've understood everything 